Welcome to the Growing in Grace podcast, where you can listen in on some casual conversation about the good news of Jesus without all of the inconsistent religious double talk. If you've ever struggled with feelings of hopelessness, guilt, and despair, or wondered if you're really right with God, it's time to discover the true freedom that comes with the gospel of unlimited and overflowing grace. The podcast guys, Mike and Joel, growingingrace.org. Welcome aboard. We're glad you're with us. I don't know how you found out about us, but we're glad you're there. We've been doing this for a while, and we're recently celebrating over 800 weekly podcasts, taking a look back at some of the things we've talked about uh, over the last more than 15 years. Last week, Joel, we were talking about the subject of tithing, and I know we kind of left off in in mid-thought. Hopefully, you're doing okay this week. I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. Loving reminiscing and looking back on these things because, well, like I mentioned last week, I'm not really a talkative person. But when it comes to this stuff, it's just let loose inside of me, I guess. <laughs> and I go to town and I really do love this. I like writing about it and I like talking about it. So this podcast has been beneficial, not just for the listener, but also for you and me, Cap, as we have um, week by week talk these things out. Yeah, so to get back with um, where we left off last week, we were talking about tithing, and I know that there are some people who listen who do believe in tithing, and you know, you can take what we say for what it's worth. Nobody has to agree with us in anything that we talk about. There's no law that says you have to agree with us (laughs) on anything, and I know that this can be somewhat of a divisive issue, even within the grace community. That's just the way it is. And hopefully some of the things we share will give you food for thought if you are not in line with what we're saying. But I ended last week by talking about Abraham's tithe to Melchizedek. And in short, it had been after a battle had taken place. And if you look at a map, which I did, where Lot was taken from, Abraham's nephew, and where they were taken to, it's approximately 200 miles And then Abraham, where he lived, he had to go around 160 miles. This, again, if you look at a map, you can can see all this stuff. So it's not as if when Abraham gave a tenth to Melchizedek, that he gave a tenth of everything that he owned. It's not like he... (laughs) He went on this journey and brought a tenth of everything that he owned so that when he would win the battle and win back Lot and his family and all their possessions, that he would give a tenth of his own possessions to Melchizedek. Because the scripture says, Abraham gave a tenth of all, a tithe of all. Well, the all there was not all that Abraham owned. It was a tenth of all of the spoils of war. And it was a one-time thing. We don't see this recorded any other times. We don't see anything like this happening anywhere else. And it wasn't like Abraham was thinking to himself, there's a principle here that I'm following, this principle of a tithe. And so he wasn't starting a principle, and he wasn't trying to get the church. He wasn't looking ahead to this the new covenant and thinking, well, if I do this, then they can look at my example and they can give a tenth of their income perpetually to a church. For the rest of their entire Christian life, because I give a tenth of the spoils of war to Melchizedek, then they can give a tenth of their income to a church forever. That's not what any of this was about. Really, Hebrews 7 talks about the significance of this tithe, Abraham's tithe to Melchizedek. Hebrews 7 is so rich. We talked about Hebrews, I think, a couple of weeks ago. The point that the writer was making in Hebrews 7 was that Jesus is superior to the Levites. Jesus, you know, the priesthood of Jesus is superior to the priesthood of the Levites. The writer has to make this point. He has to help the people understand that, see, put yourself in the shoes of these Hebrew people who have been under the blood of bulls and goats all these years. They've been under this priesthood where the Levites were the priests, and the writer here has to help them to understand that Jesus is the high priest, and he supersedes and does away with the Levite priesthood. And so he uses the example of Abraham's tithe to Melchizedek to show that Melchizedek, since he's the one that was tithed to, Melchizedek then is greater than Abraham. And so then Jesus... It says that Jesus is high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Jesus, then, is greater than Abraham and therefore greater than the Levites who came from Abraham. So that's really the point that's being made. It's really, really simple. 
Jesus is greater than the Levites and does away with the entire Levite priesthood and the Old Covenant as a whole. That's really the only reason the writer brings up the tithe of Abraham to Melchizedek. And one real quick thing, it says, Here mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them. That trips some people up, thinking that here, they think that that means that here in the modern church, mortal men receive tithes. No, he was talking about under the Old Covenant, the Levites received tithes, but there Melchizedek received them. He received them, of whom it is witness that he lives. Talking about how, again, the tithe that went to Melchizedek was because he is superior to the Levites. So anyway, I could go on and on about that, but it's it excites me to talk about that stuff. But hopefully people will understand that, that it's, it has nothing to do with tithing money in the church today. Yeah, you would you would hope so. There's a, a scriptural context, both Old and New Testament, on this. And and if you're getting lost in Hebrews seven with what Joel was talking about, just keep reading. You know, the the writers didn't write in verses and chapters. In chapter eight, he kind of follows up. He continues and breaks this down where it becomes a a little easier to understand. It might start out a little confusing in Hebrews seven with Melchizedek and all that, but then he breaks it down in Hebrews eight. You know, explaining how Jesus replaced that uh, Levitical priesthood. He became the high priest. And, you know, people who, who want to talk about tithing 10% of your income, when that was never really what tithing was about. In fact, the, the Old Testament explains all of this. I know people like to start out talking about the tithe in Malachi, but there were many things being taught about the tithe for the Jewish people under the law back in earlier portions of, of the Old Testament. And one of those things was if the distance where you had to take the tithe to the storehouse, if it was too far with what you had, too far to travel, you could turn your tithe into money mm -hmm. and, and use it that way. And you could even spend it on whatever your heart desired. There, there was some things there that we could have gotten into that we didn't. But so it went to the priesthood, the food, because the, the, Le the Levitical tribe, the Levites did not have those things. They did not inherit those lands and, and things that come with it. So the food from the rest of the tribes going to the tribe of the Levites, it was going to them, it was going to the priesthood. Uh, well, when the priesthood came to an end and was replaced by the priesthood of Christ, some people will say, well, now we give the tithe, 10% of our income, right, to Jesus. Well, now who represents Jesus, Joel? I, I this, this is a little bit of a head scratcher here for me. <laughs> Would it be uh, any nonprofit status, anybody who calls themselves a pastor, anybody from the Methodist Church, anybody from the Baptist Church? I mean, anybody with a you know a nonprofit status, corporation calling themselves a church, are they now the representative of Jesus who is designated to receive ten percent of everybody's income? Um, this thing has gotten so far out of context; it's it's just crazy. Yeah, and it's like, um, that is a really good question. Who is really supposed to receive, you know, if, if indeed it's it's real, it's which it's not. But because, because the person of Jesus isn't standing here receiving them, right? Right, exactly. And, you know, people will say, well, it's, you know, it's supposed to support the pastor and the church. But where does the scripture say that? You know, where is that ever? Because people will say, show me in scripture where tithing ended. <laughs> And my explanation is when tithing ended was when the old covenant ended because the tithes were meant to support the Levite priesthood and the priesthood ended because Jesus. And so, but, you know, people will say, and I think this is a good point that I heard someone say recently that Ephesians 4.11 says, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And so in the church today, basically, you have the tithe going to pay the pastor, but why doesn't it go to pay apostles, prophets, evangelists, and teachers? I think that's a good point. And the point being that people have uplifted, have um, raised up the level of pastor to something that's really, really more than what it's supposed to be. I appreciate pastors. I appreciate what pastors do, but there are people who are walking in a gift, just like everybody else in the church is. And I mean, I could get into some weeds there, but I won't. But the point being is that where does it say that tithes, tithes of money are supposed to go to support any of this? It, it doesn't. You have to take verses, you have to take scriptures, the various ones that we've talked about from Malachi, uh, Jacob's tithe, um, Abraham's tithe, 
You have to misuse those scriptures in order to make a case for, well, we've got a church building, uh, we've got um, a pastor, and we've got a staff, and we've got uh, programs, and so we're going to use tithes of people's money to pay for all this stuff. Now, so how does how do these things get paid for? How do how do we support the church? It's called giving, not tithing. It's just something that in the new covenant we are encouraged to give. Giving is a great thing. So we never want to say that we are discouraging people from giving. We want to encourage people to give because giving is a great thing. You can give to anybody who is in need. It doesn't have to be to a church. It doesn't have to be to somebody who you're it was an official, uh, an official ministry position. You can give to help people in any way that you want. Yeah, um, th- and that's the bottom line. We're we're not against giving, not at all. Um, but and there's so there's there's ways to support your church. There's ways to support and give to people who are in need. But manipulating people into doing it, taking something completely out of context with with tithing ten percent of your your income. That's just going down the, the wrong road. Second Corinthians 9, 7, Paul said, Each one must give as he has decided, decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. I might mention God also loves uncheerful givers, <laughs> but he likes it when people can give cheerfully. So just do what's on your heart to do. That's what will cause cheerful giving. That's what's going to, you know, just people doing what they want, operating under grace, doing what's on your heart. Um and and I think if if we could learn to live that way, we'd we'd probably see financial floodgates open up mm-hmm. for some of these uh, ministries and organizations that that need help in supporting others. So I I think um, I I mean I, I get the concern I, I get the concern that it, it it takes resources to fund things and to support the people who are working in, in those uh, organizations. We totally get that. Um, but we just want to be able to do this uh, under under grace because it's completely taken it out of context, the tithing system that the Jews were under uh, when it comes to the law compared to uh, having all of that come to an end and now just people giving out of grace. Uh, completely different thing, and I know a lot of people wrestle with it, but there's a context here, uh, again, from cover to cover in these pages, and uh, I'm afraid that in, in many cases a lot of people – have uh, been put into bondage uh, when it comes to being uh, obligated to give, um, and that's just not a good place to be. Yeah, absolutely not a good place to be at all. Bondage is never a good thing, especially this religious bondage. You know, when people are held captive to principles that aren't even in the Bible, uh, legalism and, and things that people just make up, like you know, giving 10% of your income to a church. Well, another thing that people have made up as we continue on next week, looking back at the highlights of, of topics that we have talked about over the years, the spirit of the law. Have you ever heard that phrase, the spirit of the law? People talk about how, well, we don't live by the law, we live by the spirit of the law. Well, that phrase, the spirit of the law, is completely made up. It's not found in your Bible not found in the scriptures. We'll talk about that and why it's important that we know this coming up next week on Growing in Grace. This has been Growing in Grace with Mike Kapler and Joel Brzezinski, heard online through various internet sources around the world each week. Access past programs by visiting growingingrace.org. Share it with a friend and listen again next week for more Growing in Grace.